So we're back at it again. This is the Bazooka Season 4, Episode 4, Pediatrics. Grab a piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to the Bazooka. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is on my YouTube channel where we look at 10 OSCE stations in one clinical course. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon so you never miss such amazing content every time I post. Drop a like, drop a comment to show some support. And a big disclaimer, there are some graphical images that are contained in this presentation and they are only meant for teaching purposes. You already know the drill of these videos. You may pause the video to write down your answer, scream it at your friend, and pretty much just answer the questions that I'm about to give you. So I hope you have your piece of paper and let's begin. So station one, study the image and answer the questions that follow. Identify what is shown in the image. What are some indications of its use? Mention four, comp four components found in the sachet. What things does this such it correct? You may pause the video. And here comes the answer. So this is obviously oral rehydration solution. And it's going to be used in the management of both no dehydration and some dehydration, which may be due to acute diarrhea or disease, or it may be due to persistent diarrhea. It's going to be consisting of glucose, citrate, potassium, sodium, and chloride. Remember, zinc is not present in ORAS, and the things that it does correct include things like hypoglycemia, electrolyte imbalance, as well as some dehydration. Station two, study the image and answer the questions below. What is shown in the image? What condition is it used to diagnose? What are the complications of this condition? List 10. What other investigations would you order? List five. You may pause the video at this particular moment. And here comes the answer. So this is a rapid diagnostic testing kit for malaria. Of course, plasmodium falciparum antigen uh, testing kit. And of course, it's going to be used in the uh, diagnosis of malaria. Complications include cerebral malaria, pulmonary edema, algid malaria, metabolic acidosis, severe anemia, hypoglycemia, jaundice, prostration, DIC, black water fever, and acute kidney injury. Other investigations include a random blood sugar estimation, urea, electrolytes, and creatinine, malaria parasite slide, arterial blood gases, a clotting profile, a chest x-ray, as well as a full blood count. Station 3. A child was brought to the emergency department and a picture is shown on the right. What striking feature do you notice? What is the most likely diagnosis? What is the main cause of your physical findings? What investigations would you do to confirm the diagnosis? The child is noted to have had frequent hospital admissions. Write down two most frequent causes of his admission. On one admission, the child is found to have fever and tachypnea. Write down two differentials. You may pause the video at this particular moment. And here comes the answer. So as you can see, you have this frontal bossing, which is rather quite apparent. This is most likely consistent with sickle cell anemia. And remember, you have this frontal bossing because of the extra medullary erythropoiesis that's happening in these bones. Then you can do a sickling test as well as HB electrophoresis. The most frequent reasons why patients actually do get admitted to the ward include things like vaso-occlusive crisis, as well as a hyperhemolytic crisis. And if you get a child who's admitted with a fever, tachypnea, or any respiratory symptoms, you should always assume that they may have either an acute chest syndrome or a pneumonia. Station four, describe what you see in the pictures. What is your most likely diagnosis? Mention two laboratory investigations that will help you confirm your diagnosis. What is the first line drug for managing this condition and what is the dose? List six side effects of the drug in question four. You may pause the video at this particular moment. 
And here comes the answer. So as you can see, this child has some periorbital edema. They have swelling of the upper limb, swelling of the lower limb, swelling of the scrotum over there. And so they have this generalized swelling, which we refer to as anasaka. They also have this frothy urine at the bottom. So this is most likely consistent with nephrotic syndrome. And you can make a diagnosis using our urine protein creatinine ratio, as well as our serum albumin estimations. Then the drug of choice is going to be prednisolone or prednisone. If you're giving prednisolone, you give it a 2 milligrams per kg per day with a maximum of 60 milligrams per day for about 4 to 6 weeks. Then after this 4 to 6 weeks, you switch to 1.5 milligrams per kg and with a maximum of 40 milligrams on alternate days for the next 2 to 5 months. And then you taper it off. Then this must be done with a minimum total duration of treatment that's about 12 weeks. Side effects include a moon face appearance, which is consistent with cushionoid appearance, mood swings, osteoporosis, abdominal striae, lightening of the skin, easy bruising, peptic ulceration, growth retardation, aseptic necrosis of the femoral head, as well as immunosuppression and recurrent infections. Station 5. Look at this baby, shown in the picture. Describe what you see. What is the most likely diagnosis? What complications do you anticipate in this patient? Mention two tests you would order at birth. The baby passed meconium on day five of life. What is the most likely diagnosis? You may pause the video and here comes the answer. So as you can see, we have these epicanthal folds. We have a flat nasal bridge. We have upslanting palpebral fissures. And of course, we have a, quite a bigger tongue, ma the macroglossia. So this is consistent with our trisomy 21 or our Down syndrome. Remember, you would anticipate things like hypothyroidism, tracheoesophageal atresia, Hirschsprung's disease, duodenal atresia, imperforate anus, endocardial cushion defects, as well as recurrent respiratory infections. You'd want to do an echocardiograph of the heart, as well as order for thyroid function tests. That's your TSH, your T3, and T4. And one of the causes of delayed passage of meconium is high sprung's disease where the ganglion failed to migrate to the distal part of the colon. Station six, describe what you see and what do you call this picture? This is the picture here. List four possible causes of this picture. List four investigations you would do to help you ascertain your diagnosis. You may pause the video at this moment and here comes the answer. So as we can see here, we have our white blood cell count, which is 2.1. So that's low. They have leukopenia. RBC of 1.12, that's also low. And the HB is also low. So they also have a low MCV. So they have a microcytic type of anemia. Our platelet is also 82. It's also low. So they have a thrombocytopenia as well. So this overall picture is what we refer to as pancytopenia. So it's caused by infections like viral infections like CMV, EBV, HIV, parvovirus B19, as well as malaria and TB. It may be caused by other conditions like leukemias, myelodysplastic disorders, heavy metal poisoning, drugs such as zidovudine, which can cause myelosuppression, as well as chloramphenicol. You may also have SLE as well as sequestration crisis in sickle cell disease or sickle cell anemia. Four investigations are going to include a peripheral smear, uh, bone marrow aspirate or biopsy, reticulocyte count, uh, liver function tests, LDH, D dimers, sickling, or as well as an HB electrophoresis. Station 7. Identify the images shown above. When would you use these instruments? List three indications for the use of instrument B. How would you know that you have inserted instrument B correctly? You may pause the video at this particular moment. Write down your answer. If you're enjoying these videos, drop a like. It helps with the YouTube algorithm. And here comes the answer. So A over here is an ambu bag with a face mask. B is a nasogastric tube. C is a penguin sucker. We use these three things during the process of resuscitation. Remember that an NGT can be used for feeding purposes. It can be used for gastric emptying. It can be used in unconscious patients for the administration of oral drugs. How would you know that it's in situ? Generally, when you place the end that's outside the body, immersed underwater, there will be no bubbles. You can also aspirate gastric content and actually check for the pH, and it's often acidic. And of course, you can flush some air in it, and you can also rotate over the area of the stomach. You'll be able to hear the rush of air 
into the stomach. Station 8. DT, a two-year-old Zambian boy of African descent, has been admitted to UTH A block with a sustained painful erection of one day duration without prior stimulation. The mother gave a history of one previous admission for anemia and jaundice during which time the child was investigated and a diagnosis was made. What condition has the patient presented with? What most likely disease does DT have that predisposes him to having sustained painful erections? Mention two other disorders that may cause sustained painful erections. Write two principles of management that you would institute to treat this child's condition. What is a long-term management of patients with such conditions? You may pause the video and here comes the answer. So this is of course priapism and most commonly going to be caused by sickle cell anemia. Remember this child has anemia, they have jaundice and they're presenting to you with this persistent painful erection. Remember that the definition of priapism is a persistent, purposeless, uh, prolonged, painful penile erection. Then other conditions that can cause this include lymphomas, leukemias, drug ingestion, as well as polycythemia rubra vera. And our management principles are going to include pain control, hydration, as well as a transfusion or a red cell exchange. And long-term management is going to be including giving this patient's folate for life, malaria prophylaxis, as well as a pneumococcal vaccine. Coming to station nine, a two-year-old boy was brought to the emergency department with the following skin lesions. The mother reports a history of a fever and diarrhea, but no history of trauma or burns. Part one, describe what is shown in the picture. How do you grade what is shown in the picture? List four factors which may contribute to what is shown in the picture. Which daily charts would you review to help you understand and manage this case better? List five investigations that you would order to determine complications of this condition. So you may pause the video and here comes the answer. So obviously this child has severe dermatosis. As you can see, they have peeling of the skin. You have some ulcerations here and some of these exposures. So most likely this is a grade three type of dermatosis. And remember, dermatosis is going to be graded as grade one, where there's just hypopigmentation with a few rough patches on the arms and the legs. Grade two is the moderate, where you have this multiple patches and peeling of the arm and the legs. Grade three is where you have this fissures, the raw skin, the flaking, and these ones carry a greater risk of infection. Then things that may actually contribute to this include a low socioeconomic status, low educational status of the caregivers. For example, you may not know when to feed the child, what to feed the child. And of course, it can be recurrent infections like diarrhea, respiratory infections, TB, and HIV. It may also be as a result of poor feeding. Remember that this is very easy to confuse with staphylococcal scalded syndrome. But of course, given the history, it would be unlikely in this case. Then the drugs that you want to review or the charts you want to review are going to include the weight chart, the temperature chart, as well as the feeding chart. Another investigations include a full blood count with a differential count, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, gastric lavage, of course, for gen expert and uh, ruling out TB, a chest X-ray, a retroviral test, as well as urine microscopy culture and sensitivity. Coming to our last station, which what instrument is shown in the picture? What is it used for? What condition is it used to diagnose? List six complications of your diagnosis in Question three, you may pause the video and write down your answers. And here comes the answer. So this is a stadiometer and it's going to be used for measuring the length of the height of a child. It can be used in the diagnosis of severe acute malnutrition and complications include hypoglycemia, hypothermia, dehydration, electrolyte imbalance, infections, as well as refeeding syndrome, which can be as a result of aggressively feeding the child. Here's a bonus station. Leave your comments in the comment section below. I'll leave the pinned comment of the first person that gets it correct. So study the x-ray shown in the image and answer the questions. What does the x-ray show? What is it, your most likely diagnosis? List four clinical features you would elicit. How would you manage this child? So do not forget to leave your comments below. I really hope you enjoyed this video of the bazooka. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel. Hit the bell notification icon so you never miss on such amazing content every time I post. To Zambia and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.